Hi everyone, welcome to Yale, welcome to, be, uh, welcome to Brisbane. It's really great to be here. Uh, really happy to be sharing REA's journey fighting software entropy. Would help if I brought the clicker. So thank you for that introduction. My name is Alison Rose Warren. I'm the Executive Manager of Architecture at REA. Uh, and I've been at this for a while. I've been working in software for over two decades. You can see me there doing some pair programming on a Python code base at REA. Uh, and I'm co-presenting today with Stu. Yeah, my name's Stu Bledo. Um, I've been working at REA for a while now as well. Uh, Alison managed to drum up this old photo. Remember when we had physical card walls all the time? I really missed that. Um, that was about 11 years ago. I haven't aged a day, which is nice. Um, I've been fighting software entropy for about 14 years. I've been in the industry longer than that. The first few years I was just making a mess and kind of not cleaning up after myself. Um, this is a bit of a story of kind of that, the, the more recent journey on that. So to help set the scene for today's talk, I wanted to talk about the, the life of successful software. So this sort of journey, and I've got a graph to help illustrate this. So along the x-axis, you can see the passage of time. And on the y-axis is a kind of developer's uh, reaction to needing to work on this particular code base. So in the beginning, many, many possibilities. It's always a good time to join a project when you can make decisions and everything is new. Over time, you tend to learn more about the world that you're modeling. You might find yourself constrained by some of the earlier decisions that you've made. Um, and so gradually it gets that kind of little bit less fun. You know, maybe you make some tactical choices. And then hopefully if the software is successful, you know, it doesn't get killed. It moves into maintenance mode. And you might be off on another project. Um, and at that point, you find sort of that maintenance effort drops off and you're not patching as often. And this is when the health of the system, um, your reaction to working on it does tend to drop off. Uh, you might have a brief resurgence. You know, maybe someone joins the team. They're really passionate about this stuff. They do a bunch of cleanup. Um, or your company might decide, you know, it's time to invest in automation. And there's a little uptick. But generally, the decay tends to set in. So the question is, how long until any piece of software becomes legacy? What is this value in your organization? Do you measure it in months, in quarters, in years, or decades? To understand this a bit better, uh, we thought that we would look to physics and see if there are any answers there. And so we're look we've looked to the second law of thermodynamics. So Rudolf Clausius, he's a German mathematician, and he introduced the law, uh, second law of thermodynamics and the concept of entropy. Entropy is the measure of disorder in a system, and it has these characteristics. So systems inherently move to disorder. And the more disorder that's present in a system, the less energy that's available to do work. Here's an example from the real world. So if you think about a sandcastle, when you first make it, when you take it out of the mold on the beach, it has a lot of structure which means it has a lot of order, so it has very low entropy. But over time, you know, the wind starts eroding the sandcastle, you get your seagulls come along, maybe there's some kids on the beach that jump all over it, and so the structure starts to decay. And eventually you're left with just sand, so very high entropy. And this is what is most likely to happen, right? The sandcastle could form by itself from the wind, but that's, that's very unlikely. So when we were pre preparing for this talk, Stu and I saw some parallels with those sandcastles and that software from the graph that I shared earlier. And so we choose to, uh, to define software entropy as the measure of disorder within software. And the characteristics of software entropy are that software inherently moves to disorder and that the more disorder that's present, the less energy that's available to do work. And so in the same way that we see that you know, uh, structured systems have lower entropy, we feel like structured software has lower entropy as well. And therefore, that's the kind of the less likely state for things to be in. Uh, Dave Farley talked yesterday about how it's really important to have you know, those characteristics of our architecture around kind of modularization, um, you know, the uh, interfaces between systems having high cohesion and low coupling, separation of concerns, that they're really like these fundamental traits of managing software complexity. So it really tells us that it, it's our software architecture. That, that's what defines the modularity and the interaction between systems. And really the presence of good software architecture is a characteristic of high-performing teams, high-performing organizations. 
and that's something that came out in the um, in all of the state of DevOps reports. Um, my clicker stopped working. Um, this one's from 2017, but it says high performing teams were more likely to have loosely coupled architectures. And loosely coupled really helps us think about that structure. Loosely coupled you know, makes us think that there must be this separation into modules, that there's defined boundaries between them um, and, and defined interfaces between them. And so it's this, this kind of, that's the structure that we're talking about. And that's what tends to decay over time and become less ordered. So why does software decay? It, over the years, many things contribute to this, but you know, we make compromises along the way, you, you know, due to deadline pressure or other constraints that the dependence we, dependencies we use, they date over time and they change. The way we build software, the approaches change. The way we build software now compared to a decade ago and two decades ago has changed a lot. So software that lives for a long time, you know, tends to become like disordered and different to the way we would build it now. Uh, and we have that shared understanding that's lost over time, just as the people that contribute to it uh, change over time as well. Uh, this isn't a, a new concept. So um, there was research done by Mai Lehman and Laszlo Belady back in the 70s that looked at um, the laws of software evolution. And these are some of the things that they observed, that, that there's continuing change in software as it continues to be maintained, that there's increasing complexity, continued growth, and declining quality. So that's the thing, so things tend to change, they become increasingly complex, and there's less quality over time. Um, and that's important for us because software entropy affects the internal quality of our system. This is from a, a blog post that Martin Fowler wrote in 2019. Um, he said, with most software systems, it becomes harder to add new features over time. And he gave these examples of a clean system at the top and what he called a crafty system at the bottom. So like an ordered system and a disordered system. And said that you know, our job is to string things together, string bits of software together to do useful work. And in a clean system, that's quite straightforward. But in a crafty system, there's this ongoing tax and we have to work around all these other things. It's less clear how to string things together uh, in, a, in a nice way. And the time to market for building new features goes on. I think that was represented in Adam, people that went to Adam Tornhill's talk yesterday. You know, he had research showing that you know, the time to market is longer uh, with more variability and more bugs um, for, if there's lower quality software. And so, but that crafty system, that's the more likely state that the um, the disordered state is much more likely to occur rather than the clean state. So we need this constant effort to come back to that clean state. In terms of why should we should care about you know, deteriorating structure and quality, uh, there was a, an Accenture survey done a few years ago which asked a bunch of people, um, a whole series of statements around kind of technology and tech debt around, you know, was it harder to build features? How could they innovate? How could they adopt new technologies? And generally these things were found to be harder if you um, had accumulated tech debt and less quality. But the, the one I like the most is this one that said, it said, do you agree with the following statement? I would like to tear up all of our organization's core systems. And I'm sure that some people here can relate to that feeling of kind of futility and frustration when you have to work with a really old legacy system. Um, and when they put this out to the survey, 81% of people agreed with this statement. So 81% of people would like to tear up their organization's core systems. Um, and actually, 17% were neutral. There were only 2% that actually disagreed with this statement. Uh, which feels kind of disappointing uh, as an industry. Um, but that's, that's where we're at, and that seems to be the more likely state that things uh, decay into. This is, this is a challenge that we've had at REA, because the more software you have, the more entropy you're going to have. Uh, this is a graph of the, the number of different software systems uh, at REA that have been built you know, over the last 20 plus years. So you can see around 2010, the company really started scaling. Um, this is when Alison and I joined around this time, so it's possible some of this is our fault. Um, these systems do valuable work as well. Um, you know, 2013, we adopted microservices. There's a big boom in the number of systems being created. And in recent years, we've shifted to this internal platform strategy that has seen a kind of a tapering off of the number of new software systems being built. That's something we'll touch on later. But more software um, increases entropy. And also varying technologies increases entropy, just the total amount of software that you have. Uh, this is the product of, you know, when you work on software for 20 plus years, you accumulate lots of different pieces of technology. So, you know, TypeScript, Scala, Swift, Java, you probably add Kotlin and Python in there these days as well. Lots of different, you know, cloud deployment technologies. Um, I didn't actually go and check how many JavaScript frameworks are in use. I, I just didn't want to know, um, but I pulled out a few. So Backbone and Angular being big ones. Uh, there's still some Backbone hanging around from a decade ago. 
Um, there's probably others. I don't, I don't want to look too closely. Um, but the, all these come with their own ecosystem, their own dependencies, their own tooling. And all of that um, increases the total amount of software you have. And if that's all decaying over time, that adds to the effort that you have to fight software entropy. So we were looking at physics before and understanding the second law of thermodynamics and entropy. And it turns out that physics provides some potential clues for us in solving this problem of software entropy. It is possible to decrease entropy within a system so long as that system is open and you've got the opportunity to inject energy uh, or exchange matter. So when we consider software entropy, our system of work and how we organize ourselves and the architectural choices that we make can help provide the matter or the structure. And we come to work and we uh, invest our energy and our effort. So we can certainly add energy to help tackle this problem. So today, Stu and I are asking the question, how can we fight software entropy? We're using physics to help us. Firstly, we need to invest in defining the structure. Thinking back to that sandcastle, how can we introduce more order? And then we need to add energy, add effort into this, uh, into this problem. So first, we're going to talk about our architecture practice. The Cambridge Dictionary defines architecture as the design and structure of computer systems. And we know from the physics lessons that structure or order is really important which tells us that architecture should be important as well. But a coherent architecture is not just going to show up, right? Sandcastles don't appear by themselves. You need to put some effort in. And so at REA, we went about by doing this, by introducing architectural principles to make sure that we're consistently valuing the same things when we're making decisions, when we're considering different trade-offs. So the principles that we've defined, they look like this. So each one has got a short name, it's clear, it's memorable. There is an explanation for what the principle means and then a rationale or an explanation for why you should care. We also include a number of tangible examples, right? We don't wanna have sort of motherhood statements. We want something that you can practically apply in your work day to day. Here's an example of one of these principles. So keep it clean. So we believe that constant cleaning is part of work well done. So rather than raising cards to refactor or improve that may or may not get scheduled in your backlog, uh, it's part of the work and it's part of the definition of done. And the reason why is because incremental improvement, it adds up, right? Sometimes you can look at a code base, you don't know where to begin, you just begin, right? Every improvement makes a difference. And it's a really good habit and a mindset to have as software engineers. So some practical examples, right? You can add some documentation. You might find there's some static analysis violations, right? They're really good clues to issues that you have in the code base. Increased test coverage, tune monitoring. This is a really cut down version of the definition because to provide clarity, we have, uh, we've got a documentation site, right? So we've got multiple paragraphs of information. Here's the full set of architectural principles. And it's important to note that we workshop this across our community. So people came together, we raised Git issues, we identified common patterns, and then pulled out this set. So one is about adopting the platform, and we'll talk about this more later. We have a principle around making our code bases approachable so that future us can understand them, newcomers can make sense of them. Keep it clean, I've just mentioned. Deploying continuously is about valuing a fast feedback loop, making sure that you start with continuous deployment so that you're always releasing value and getting feedback quickly. Building security in is about starting with security in your processes, in your mindset. It's not something you can bolt on after the fact. Managing data is key. We need to understand what we have and to be able to share that data and understand it, but without compromising privacy or trust. And mapping the business domain means we're focusing on the business problems first, right? We're not jumping to the technical solution. We're saying, how can we model the business? What are the appropriate bounded contexts? We have other mechanisms at REA as well that help improve our architecture and thus provide that structure or order. So we have a technology strategy and this outlines where we're trying to go. 
We've got decision-making frameworks, which make sure that the architectural principles are considered and they're transparent, so there's a high degree of visibility. We also invest in knowledge management. You know, Stu mentioned people leave over time. It can be very hard to understand why decisions were made. Um, investing in knowledge management is key. And then there's also a set of sensible defaults, right? So decisions that we've made that we know work well at REA that you can just use without needing to completely re-prosecute the decision. So I really love this quote from Ellen Ullman. So she's a computer programmer turned author. Uh, and she talked about the Y2K bug and about how that was a really good sensible default decision for a number of decades until it wasn't. And she says that people who have no choice are generally unhappy. But people with too many choices are almost as unhappy as those who have none at all. And so we've been looking at um, how can we support freedom from choice uh, with an internal tech radar? I'm sure many of you have heard uh, and used the ThoughtWorks tech radar to look at new technologies, things that you might want to be looking at and thinking it about. We have an internal tech radar that uh, looks at our sensible defaults within REA. What are the things that are kind of recommended things to adopt uh, within your teams? What are the things that we're experimenting with and perhaps technologies like Backbone that we're trying to phase out? Um, Pearl, we've still got Pearl from the 90s. Um, not much of it left, but that, that's still being phased out. Um, and so people talk a lot about freedom of choice, but this freedom from choice is really liberating and really lowers the cognitive load uh, on, a, on your teams. And so you can really focus on decisions that are important for your teams and shipping your products, but not having to make every little micro decision around kind of building a piece of technology. So this is, um, it, it, it's a really valuable tool for driving alignment and, and a bit more constraint. So this is a, a screenshot of the, the tech radar that uh, we, we have at REA. It has a lot more blips than the ThoughtWorks one because we, we don't drop them off when they're kind of not interesting to talk about anymore. It's actually our inventory of all the technologies that we have. And so just an example of, of where this is being used in that web frameworks space. So we, we experimented with lots of different web frameworks over the years, but over recent years we've really consolidated down on React. That is, um, we actually say that down the bottom of here. It says React is the sensible default for building user interfaces at REA, which you think if you're building a web front end, um, that's that's the default. We have similar ones for kind of our native iOS and Android apps, um, where we're definitely going after those, those native experiences uh, rather than cross-platform ones. Um, but this is the example in the, in the web space. And it has a second piece there that says React is the foundational technology for our web platform and design system. That's something we'll touch on later, that actually constraining the number of technologies that are used uh, actually means there's, there's less total software, less variation in the system, and that means less entropy to fight as well. Um, and so they're, they're things that we're doing, both the principles and the tech radar, to kind of put some, some direction uh, around alignment and decisions and constraints on the amount of technology. And we also need to add energy in. So when you look at that entropy example, you, you need to understand what structure you're aiming for. Uh, you also need to put energy in to try and maintain and to build that structure. And that is largely happens in this space by the efforts of you know, our architects, our tech leads, and a lot of our senior developers across the business to actually, that are doing the work and making the decisions to make this show up. So our architects from across the business, uh, they, they work together. We, we embed all of our architecture and tech leads within uh, the, the business functions. They're there helping guide that tech strategy, guide decisions, feeling, feeling the pain and really surfacing that up. But they have 20% of their time where they work together on kind of common technology decisions and, and alignment and tech strategy across the organization. And that's, that's a, a lot of effort going into the system that's really dedicated to, to structure and alignment rather than this natural disorder that happens. So that's a little bit about how our architecture practice is, is helping us fight software entropy. That architectural alignment um, decreases the amount of entropy in the system. So that's a good thing. Um, that the principles they help drive consistency of decisions, so again, less variability. And that freedom from choice reduces cognitive load and reduces that variation in the teams as well. Um, this does, you know, dedicated time is required to drive these outcomes. This stuff doesn't just show up. You can't just have best intentions. You actually have to have people that have dedicated time, and dedicated capacity to think about and work on these things as well. Uh, so next, I'll talk about engineering excellence. So it's quite easy to say that you value engineering excellence. Um, it's, you know, it's quite popular. No one's going to uh, disagree with that. It's important to actually start thinking about what does this mean within your organization, to start building out 
uh, a shared understanding so that you can actually answer the question, what is good software? Uh, what is less good software? You know, what is order versus disorder? What is structure uh, versus a mess? So at REA, uh, we started with opinions. So we got together and we, we mapped out our architecture. So we took physical cards, we wrote the name of each system. Of course, we used red cards for legacy. And then we assessed what's the, the state of each piece of software according to development, operations, and architecture. And then there was a bit of a gut feel assessment for, is it good? Are there problems? You know, is it awful? And then as we did this multiple times, we would track the trend. Are things improving? Uh, are they not improving? And so we put all these cards up on a wall. Um, and this was back at our old office. And it turns out, visualizing this was really, really powerful. Right? You could see everything all together. You could see where data was flowing through your systems. You could see how much legacy you had, right? Because you could just look at all the red cards. And then it turns out that it was a really useful artifact for other stakeholders as well. When we were planning out projects, we'd bring people to the wall and we'd say, well, we're starting off here, maybe we're building a new piece, but then we have to start touching these pieces and these pieces and these pieces, and um, maybe they're, they're not in the best state, which means it's going to be harder. And the other thing that really helped was really changing that language. It turns out when we were talking about tech debt, and tech debt is a really good term that you know, is understandable because it relates to you know, like credit debt or financial debt. But the term had started to lose meaning. And so when we actually started talking about potentially risk, so when we said working in this area, there's more uncertainty, there's more risk, we're talking about health, these concepts were a lot more relatable. Um, which meant that we were having better conversations. After we'd done this for a while and we were using our opinions, once again, we had to consider uh, the, you know, the lessons of entropy, that we wanted to remove ambiguity so that we can be really, really clear what is that ordered state that we're after so that teams can clearly head in that direction. So we set about writing these definitions down. So there's three lenses that I mentioned that contribute to the system health assessment. We agreed that the development lens was really a measure of how confidently can you come to a new, new code base, understand it, and then make changes safely. From an operational perspective, teams at REA have a you build it, you run it uh, philosophy, which means they look after the software in business hours and after hours. So it's very important to answer the question, can you actually support the system? Is there support documentation? And do you know if that system is behaving or it's not behaving as expected? And then from an architectural perspective, to consider is the design extensible? We know change is constant. Are we going to be able to change it? And is it fit for purpose? And then from a traffic light perspective, we kind of did away with the good, bad, awful language, a little bit judgmental, and moved towards considering whether the system meets our expectations, which is the green lens, Partial meat, which is amber or yellow, or a kind of complete mismatch of expectations, which is the red. So we have a look at what those uh, ratings look like. Uh, we, this is really about adding structure to how we, our expectations and how we think about what our software should look like. Uh, all of our systems, we deem them to start off as unhealthy. That's the default state. We have to prove that they're healthy by rating them against an agreed set of criteria, the things that we think are, are important to be considered a healthy system. Um, so ju just to start off in terms of that amber rating against these lenses, this is a simplified view, but I've tried to use language which is pretty familiar um, in the industry. So to be easily, as a developer, be able to jump in and start working with a system, we're looking at things like using a supported language. We, we use a lot of programming languages at REA, um, different ones for different purposes, but we don't just want to use any one. There's a set of supported languages, and, and we have tooling behind that. Um, that the build is containerized locally and in production. As someone who has kind of historically worked across many systems, being able to jump in and just get things up and running with Docker rather than install lots of, lots of tooling has been really valuable. Um, that the libraries and the frameworks are up to date. Um, and that when you make changes, you want to be confident uh, that they, they work. So having continuous integration, having automated tests and builds and things like that to test any code changes. Um, for the operations lens, it's more around, you know, running it in production. So having system recovery plans in place, you know, alerts and logging, how the infrastructure is deployed, those kind of things. And from an architecture point of view, it's really more around, 
you know, what is the interface of that module and how does it interact with other things? You know, do you have good uh, documentation for your architecture and how that fits into the larger system? Things like that. And then in the, um, to be considered healthy, you know, that AMBL is kind of partially meets expectations in the green area. Things like, you know, we've found that healthy software is actively worked on and maintained and deployed over time. So things like multiple contributors and multiple deployments, that's actually a major factor in keeping software healthy. Just the fact that you're working on it and deploying it regularly and having continuous deployment. That's a, a default for kind of most systems at REA that you, 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 you commit a change that'll go to production with very little human involvement. Um, or no human involvement in a lot of cases. And from an operations lens, it might be things you know, like observing observability in production, things like service level indicators, service level objectives, or kind of other, other approaches to observability in production. And from an architecture point of view, really aligning with that platform strategy, you know, understanding the responsibility and the, the um, documenting the decisions that you're making in that team as well. So the, these are all the things that we uh, deemed to be important to be considered a healthy system. If you went to Adam Thornhill's talk yesterday, he talked about five different, uh, so 25 different factors that he would measure out of the code and bubble that up to a kind of a code health metric. This is kind of at a, a larger granularity. This is at the system level, not at kind of code and classes. But this ultimately aggregates into a measure of whether we think this software is, um, is healthy or not. Uh, and we also need to then put that energy in. This doesn't come for free. Um, this is not completely automated. Some of, it, some of it is. But we actually get all of our teams to go through every quarter and rate uh, all of the systems that they have. Um, and so we get this constant measure of what is the health of our software and what is the trend in that health over time as well. So this rating does take a little bit of energy. Um, so each team, they spend time, we've built an internal tool, we call it green, green, green. They answer all those questions. Was the code deployed multiple times in the last six months? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Uh, and then the result of all of that rating is submitted as a pull request into the repository where the code lives because the metadata and information about a system should live close to where that system's code is. When that pull request is merged, we use our CI build pipelines to publish that data. Um, and then we went, have some Amazon infrastructure to also publish it to some other spots. Um, we have a digitized version of that physical wall now, so we can still see our complete architecture, but you know, we kind of ran out of index cards at some point. Uh, and the raw data is also in BigQuery, so teams can get in and look at the detail. We also provide a number of insights so that the teams can see uh, where should they invest effort um, and what's the progress been to date. And so we'll share some examples of these in a bit. So ultimately, when it comes to engineering excellence, um, it's probably your, your kind of key weapon in the fight against software, in, um, software entropy. Because as Deming says, all anyone asks for is a chance to work with pride. And if you provide that clear definition and the reward uh, for the investment that people are making, uh, it is a really great uh, culture and a place that people want to work at. So key takeaways from this section. Agree what engineering excellence means within your organization. Local context is important. Uh, radiate information so you can start building a shared understanding and using language that's meaningful across your business. You need to use objective measures as a baseline because only then can you start improving. Um, and building a culture of engineering excellence, very important. Next, we'll talk about continuous improvement. Thanks. So it's, it, it's all well and good to gather all that data and we can see those trends, but then uh, we need a process for improvement and continuously improve and maintaining this. This is an ongoing, this is the forever work of maintaining software uh, and really being able to use this data to guide that investment. It's really powerful and getting buy-in all through the organization from the company executives talking about systems health right down to developers understanding what they want to do to improve the health of their software. Um, and partly that's because the passage of time increases entropy. This is a kind of a, a histogram of the average age of systems at, at REA. And you can see that most of our software is kind of one to seven years old. Um, I actually had to cap the, the graph off at 12 years. There's some software going back older than some of our staff. Um, but, but most of it's in that bubble there. And this is largely a good thing. But the fact that we build software and maintain it for the long term means that it's valuable to the business. We're not just switching it off because it's not valuable. That's good. Um, but it does mean that some of those things, those trade-offs that you make over time or that natural decay, changing landscape, that does play out and they're things that we have to fight. Uh, there's a great quote from Marty Kagan from this blog post quite a while ago now that says, the deal with engineering goes like this. 
You know, product management takes 20% of capacity right off the table and gives this to engineering as they see fit. And if you're in a really bad shape today, you might need to make this 30% or even more. And he actually goes on to say, I'd actually be a bit nervous if people think they can get away with much less than 20%. And that's certainly what we've seen at REA, that 20% seems to be this baseline for teams that have a lot of technology that they're maintaining, this, this baseline to really keep that healthy state and to keep entropy at bay. We have a system like this, uh, we call that custodianship. Uh, it's also 20%. Uh, I believe we came up with the number independently, but that blog post is quite, quite helpful. And that's around reducing risk, paying down tech debt, you know, lowering the total cost of ownership, these kind of things. Uh, it's specifically not bug fixes. We think that you know, fixing bugs is actually just part of product development. And it's not just pumping out a feature and adding tech debt cards to some backlog that no one looks at, because we have that principle about constant cleaning being part of work well done. But ultimately, the landscape does change, and we need that, that time to invest in maintaining healthy software. And then overall, this feeds into a system around kind of adding structure to custodianship. So we have that systems health ratings to understand you know, every system at REA, uh, how healthy is that software, to see where we want to invest. That comes out every quarter, and we look at that data and understand you know, what are the things we want to fix and prioritise that, and then we reflect on that and so understand and tune that system. And this gets buy-in all the way. You know, there, there's executives in our board that are asking about, you know, how's the system health going? Like, you know, is it appropriate? And understanding the kind of the metrics coming out of that, which I think is a real change from, from years ago as well. Uh, we call this process the System Health Improvement Plan, or SHIP, you can see in the middle. That's the acronym. Uh, that's very handy. It comes up with lots of, lots of puns, kind of, you know, up... Up Ship Creek, or um, you know, same ship, different day. Um, I don't know how the. I think there's a transcript, maybe auto transcript. I'll be interested to see how that goes with that. Uh, sorry. Um, and so we do this every quarter, and we have a quarterly meeting to a uh, qu quarterly cadence where we look on this. Oh, then we can have a meeting called Talking Ship, which is great. Um, and we broadcast and analyze a bunch of this data coming out, and look at how we can improve over time. So here's an example of some of those insights that we deliver to teams to help them, uh, like I mentioned. So they're all Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, it's a bit of a view for some low-hanging fruit, right? Where have we got systems? You can just improve one criteria and it will increase its health. Um, and then on the right-hand side is a different view. It's more of a summarized view. Uh, so at the team level, because what you often find is that it can be more efficient to tackle one area across all your code bases. So for example, you might upgrade everything to React 18, um, and it's more efficient than just taking one system and saying, we'll do this, and then this, and then the next piece. Here is a Sankey diagram that shows the results of ship work for one team. Uh, this team's doing a great job, right? So there's no red systems left. They've moved to amber. We've seen some uh, yellow or amber systems move to green. And then importantly, the new systems that are being created uh, are also healthy. Because if you don't start in a healthy state, um, it's just extra work to get there later. We also invest in automation a lot. So the 20% capacity, you don't want that to keep growing and growing and growing. And so by automating throughout the DevOps kind of infinity loop, um, it means that you've got more capacity for other things. So we use Renovate. Uh, that's a tool that will help patch the dependencies within your software. It's great. It supports heaps of different programming languages, and, and we have heaps, so we find it very useful. Uh, and we also rely on our BuildKite CI CD system really heavily. So one thing we do is we have scheduled builds, so we know that we can deploy our software to production because we do it regularly, even if teams haven't made changes to those code bases. As Stu mentioned, these concepts are well understood outside of technology at REA. We talked to the board about them. Um, the executive leadership team have included them within our OKRs, or our objectives and key results. So at a top level, uh, we aimed to improve system health by 40%. And because it's measurable, we can actually show that progress um, improvement over time. And you can see what that looked like. So a couple of years ago, we redid our criteria, shifted from subjective to objective, things went a little red, introduced the ship, um, and were able to kind of get things back on track. So key takeaways relating to continuous improvement. There is a minimum constant investment that you need to make to fight software entropy. At REA, we choose to default to 20%. Some teams use more, uh, some teams can use less, and we plan this very carefully. Automation is a really great way to fight entropy with a lot less ongoing effort. Um, 
and being really clear and broadcasting the system health information helps you get that buy-in across different stakeholder groups and at all levels. Next, we'll talk about our final topic, adopting platforms. So it's great to have the 20% capacity, but you want to go beyond just fighting software entropy. And automation is another really useful tool. But we have to ask the question, what about all of that software that we're creating? Right? The more software that you write, the more entropy uh, that's in the system because you have more to maintain. And so we want our teams to look like the teams on the right, where they're spending most of their time solving customer problems, rather than the teams on the left that have a lot of other things to do. And so at REA, we find that solving co common problems once and really, really well, and then reusing these across multiple teams is how you can reduce the amount of software that you have overall. Um, at REA, we call this Colab. So this is an internal brand. Um, we've talked about this and blogged about this a bit, so you can, you can have a look on our tech blog to get more information. There's kind of two key parts to this. One is really that mindset shift. So instead of considering your local project and team and outcomes, you think about the company-wide outcomes from a, a kind of longer time frame. And it's important to shift the mindset within the organization because then you're applying those trade-off considerations uh, more consistently so you'll get similar outcomes. It's also important to treat your tech platforms as long-lived products. Right? So they should have a product manager, uh, a team that is actually supporting them, um, and documentation and support so teams can adopt them in a self-service manner. So we, we have a whole series of, of CoLab products that are kind of our internal platform that fall into a bunch of these categories that we really feel like a, that we call them the building blocks of REA technology and that's how we want to construct systems out of these building blocks so we can focus on the customer problems and not on solving every individual tech problem in every project. Um, and you saw on that graph earlier that has had a big impact. There is a bit of a lag. We, we flipped this strategy in about 2018. Obviously there's an investment that has to be made before that starts to pay off. Uh, and really in the last couple of years you've, you can see that graph start to taper off. And this is not just a global pandemic hitting and business slowing down. We grew significantly in terms of people and technology investment through that period, but we didn't need to create as much bespoke technology for that to show up. Uh, and that's really important. Um, and that's because less software, the less software you have to maintain, the lower the entropy and the, the easier this process is going to be. And so I like this idea of you know, the, these Lego blocks that you compose into software rather than individual grains of sand. If there's fewer constituent parts, you know, there's fewer uh, ways for that to be configured, there's less entropy in the system. That's what we see in physics, and we feel like that applies to software as well. Uh, so just, I want to give an example of where this is playing out. This is our web platform. We call it Argonaut. Uh, I gave a talk at Yale last year on our front-end platform strategy. Uh, this is from that. I actually deployed a demo and realized it's still live. So if you go to that URL, it's still there, um, which, you know, there's probably something in our health criteria around scanning for those things. Um, but we need very little code in this React app that actually gets bundled up and deployed by and run on the platform. And that's a fully functioning web app on realestate.com.au you know, with server-side rendering, SEO, all the scaling. And lots of those considerations around healthy software are taken care of for you. So platforms help us to reduce the total entropy in our systems. That's what we're seeing with this web platform. That there's about 20 teams using this tool internally at REA now. And it's turning out that they need about 35% less code to build their products, which is great. 75% less developer effort and 50% time to market. That's great, but the, the real one that stands out is this 90% lower custodianship. And that's really promising for the long-term maintenance of this. Now this doesn't come for free. There is a dedicated team, as Alison said, that works on these products, that maintains it, putting the energy in, but that return on investment is huge. And the reason for that is if you look at those criteria that we talked about earlier, like the platform's making it easier because a lot of these are taken care of for you. So out of all those criteria, there's a whole bunch of them that are kind of taken care of um, by the platform. So you don't need to worry about how it's deployed, the disaster recovery, you know, where the logs go, all those kind of things. You just have to concentrate on having people work on it, having multiple contributors and deployments. That's just working on software. And then what is the purpose of your software? Are you documenting the decisions and the architecture and interfaces and the purpose of your system that you're building? And that's really all that's left. Um, and that's really exciting because that means that we can build more of these products, solve more customer problems, and maintain them for the long term. So that's a bit of a look at our, our platform strategy. 
That really helps the long-term fight against software entropy because platforms reduce the amount of software you have to write and maintain, so there's less entropy in the system. Um, they also increase the overall consistency and structure because instead of lots of different ways of assembling things, there's, there's a set number of ways based on these building blocks and how you configure them. And that those reusable building blocks then reduce the total entropy in the system uh, and make it easier to fight software entropy for the long term. So quick recap, we talked about physics and entropy as a measure of disorder uh, within a system. We talked about software entropy, which is the measure of disorder within software, and then how REA tackles this through our architecture practice, uh, a culture of engineering excellence, continuous improvement, and our platform strategy. Hopefully this um, is resonates with you that software entropy is definitely a phenomenon that exists, right? It's very real um, and you ignore it at your peril. The way that we fight software entropy is to align our architecture. So to provide that structure and that order, that direction that teams are heading towards. Um, we have a culture of engineering excellence and measurement that also helps us decrease software entropy. We put the energy in to maintain that structure and the order and that's dedicated capacity within our teams and dedicated capacity for our architects and other technical leaders. And we've employed a platform strategy so that we have less bespoke software, which means less maintenance overall. And we hope that if you can get the structures in place and the right energy investment as well, then you too can fight software entropy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alice and Stuart. Uh, is, does anybody have any questions? We have about five minutes left for questions. Over here. I don't think we resolved the architecture engineering debate. Not yet, <laughs> not yet. Maybe over drinks. Come meet me. No, maybe I made, yeah, here we go, here we go, thank you. <laughs> Got to put the energy in. Save me wasting a trip. Uh, thank you for your talk, that's very interesting. Can I ask a little bit about the organisation that you have and the way you structure your architecture team to integrate or interact with the uh, development teams? I guess it's the architecture engineering question, but... Are you using uh, people out of your software engineering teams as architects or do you have specific roles? Do you manage your architecture team as its own unit? That, that sort of thing is what I'm interested in. Yep, I'm happy to take that one. Um, so one of the interesting things, I guess, about software engineering is that everybody does architecture, right? So if you look at our, you know, our developers, our staff developers, lead developers, tech leads, they're all performing um, architecture, generally sort of more solutions architecture. The architect title is those people who have more of a, an enterprise view, but they're embedded within each group. They're aligned to its local mission, um, but they also have 20% of their capacity that goes into this team. So it's sort of more of a virtual team. And within that capacity, we execute that operating rhythm around you know, the decision-making frameworks, um, around revisiting our tech strategy annually, uh, and putting the time in to agree about where do we need to take architecture long-term and connecting kind of that long-term desire in support of our business strategy with what they're seeing on the ground with initiatives that they're supporting. So we're trying to get the best of both worlds, like we don't want to be too separated from implementation and details, but equally we need people to have the headspace to kind of look up and look around and consult with one another. Thank you. Someone else? It's the far side to make you move. Somebody closer? <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Uh, so we talked about the rating system. Uh, uh, could you give us some examples of what those questions were that you put up to the engineers? Um, so the, obviously this is a very um, concise view of them. Um, so let's look at something like the security controls one. 
so you can just say we've got some, we've got some controls around our security practices. But actually, if you go through and look at that, it'll be things like, you know, uh, do you have um, vulnerability scanning in place for your code? Um, I can't remember all the tools. Maybe like tenable scanning on kind of containers or infrastructure, um, and and a few other things in place. And so there's essentially there's a thing that you can go through and go yes 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 I do all those things. Um, and so um, th that one in particular is quite um, rigid. There's basically a set of things you need to tick all those boxes because that that needs to be satisfied. Um, you know, whether your system has a single responsibility, that's, we like to think that these are absolutely objective. That's probably a little bit nuanced still around, you know, and your team might consider it to be like well-defined, but maybe another team doesn't. So there's a few there that are a bit more nuanced. But each of these has a kind of a, a, a page description. And the biggest thing is it, we try and link them to examples throughout the business that both satisfy and don't satisfy that criteria. So people can go through and get a sense of, like, okay, I kind of understand how that works. And then, you know, we, we do review these more broadly, um, particularly the architects and, and some of our senior tech people look more broadly just to see if they're rated consistently. There was just an update recently that kind of pulled out a few criteria, added a few, changed some of the wording so that we, we feel like we can get better results. We don't want to change it too often, otherwise the, the trends are meaningless, but we're just trying to make micro adjustments across, across the journey so it gets more accurate. Yeah, Thank you. Ideally, it's kind of like a rising waterline, right? So as things become more baked into the platform, you know, you don't even have to ask that question anymore. Um, so we saw some things that were, you know, green, a bit more like aspirational, move down to amber, and then just become expected.